Welcome to TRW Pizza. Today, the end-to-end -end process from dough to cooking of this wonderful pizza. I hope you enjoy. Please like and subscribe if you do. Okay guys, welcome. <clears throat> I must say I've had uh, a lot of really positive and friendly feedback on my videos so far. And I'm very humbled by that. Thank you very much. Love getting some co the comments and the conversations around recipes and pizza dough approach. So please keep those coming by all means. Um, I've had a number of people now saying they really want to see my full recipe, how I make my pizza dough. I've done this a few times in different parts, but I'm now going to attempt to do the full shebang, the, the kind of soup to nuts, how I make pizza dough from scratch. So <clears throat> ingredients first, I'm going to be using the Caputo Pizzeria Flour Tipo 00, the Caputo Lievito uh, Dry Yeast, 100% Italian Dry Yeast. I'm going to use the Campesi Fine Sea Salt. I find that's excellent in terms of uh, the way it dissolves into the water. A little bit of olive oil, some uh, good quality. Yeah, I've got some organic olive oil there and some Italian mineral water. I do think that using good quality ingredients is always the best way to get the best results. And yeah, so this is this is the only things that are going to go into my pizza dough. Um, let's begin. Before, actually, before I begin, I just want to say it was re recently my birthday and I requested this beauty and um, as a present and indeed I got it it's handmade from Italy those who know know what this is and uh, I haven't used it yet but little uh, note on the side I'm looking forward to using this for my first set of pizzas that I make from this dough now how do we start so if I'm gonna make some dough I've got to ask, ask myself some fundamental questions first how many dough balls do I want and what kind of hydration do I want them? What I do is I feed that information into this Uni pizza application. So I put that I want six dough balls. Here you can do six, five, four, three. Let's put it at six. Let's put dough ball weight is 280 grams. And let's put the hydration. You can go from zero to 100, obviously. Maybe even more, I don't know. Let's put it at 66%. I think that for me, that's a good workable ratio. Salt is around 3% mark. Oil, I'll put, uh, you know what, I'm gonna not put any oil in this one. Maybe add a little bit as I start to work it. So that it's gonna proof for 24 hours at a temperature of five degrees. Instant dry yeast, as opposed to active dry yeast or fresh yeast. So instant dry yeast, as you saw, this was the instant dry yeast. And then what happens is when you input this data here, you then get your ingredients. So these numbers change based on your inputs up here. For example, if I say I want 10 dough balls, you can see this goes to 1657 grams of flour and 1093 grams of water. Bring it down to six, we're back to 994 grams of flour, 656 grams, grams of water. It also says how much salt, yeast and oil you need. I use a lot less yeast than is recommended there. I'll be using about 1.5 grams. Now, you might be wondering, if you don't know, why it says grams instead of, for example, milliliters of water. Um, that's just because the easiest way to weigh out these ingredients is to use the gram weight of each ingredient. That's how you get the best accuracy, I find. And yeah, so I'm gonna to proceed to start to make it based on six dough balls, 280 grams each, 66% hydration, instant dry yeast. So I need to first of all weigh out 656 grams of water. Very simple to do that. So, simple digital scales, nothing fancy. I am putting on the bowl. Let's get this to 656. Six. We're at 579. That's embarrassing. Let me open another bottle. Should have saw that coming. 
and controversially, I'm now going to be using Mineral Water, the Monoprix own brand. So 580 into 656. That says 658. 658 down there. I'm happy with that. We are going to leave it at 658. I am not someone who has to have things absolutely perfect. If anything, that just means it's going to have slightly more hydration, and that is not a problem for me. 66, 67, 68% hydration, I can work with that. Next, let's do the salt. So, 30 grams of salt here. I know from a lot of uh, previous pr cycles of doing this, that 30 grams of salt is about just over one and a half tablespoons of salt. Hey Siri, hmm? what is 30 grams of salt in tablespoons? 30 grams of table salt is 1.76 tablespoons. Okay. So actually, I'm going to do the sensible thing. You have a tablespoon like that, or you have these proper measuring tablespoons where a flat level is the correct technical amount. So here we go. There's one tablespoon in. Siri said 1.76. There's half. A tablespoon in and change. There we go. So that's the salt in. Again, this Campisi Italian sea salt, wonderful Sicilian sea salt, 100%. Just, just great quality, great quality. So that's the water and the salt done. I'm going to just mix the salt into the water here. Make sure it's dissolved. And that is ready to receive some flour. Next up, let's get the flour and the yeast prepared. Now, you may have noticed that I've changed my dough recipe recently. And now, rather than putting the yeast into the water, I Measure out my flour and add the yeast to that first. Flour wise, after 994 grams. So here goes. We're good. 994 grams of flour. So here you have 993 grams of flour. Now it's time for the yeast. Yeast is going to be essentially one point, just at 1.5 grams, which I am going to say is about half a teaspoon. So here we go. I've historically been putting too much yeast into my dough, but now what I do, in goes the yeast into the flour. Note it didn't go into the water, the salted water, it went into the flour. And all we'll do now is gently mix this through. Let's take it off the scales. it through so it's nicely worked in. This technique is something that is actually advised on this bottle, this tin itself. Mix through flour, it does not need to be dissolved in, dissolved in water beforehand. So what they're saying is don't put it, this in the water like I normally or used to, mix it in with the flour, 
and the flour goes into the water. I think they're the experts. I'm happy to uh, take advice from an Italian flour and yeast company. So I've done this a few times now and it has given perfectly good results. So I like it as an approach. Excellent. That beautiful flour is now mixed in with the beautiful yeast. There we go. So now we know we have the right amount of flour, which is 994 grams, and the right amount of water, which is 656 grams, to make a 66% hydration, six balls weighing 280 grams. Next is the simple task of adding the flour to the water the flour and yeast to the water, I should say. And start to work them together. This all, the magic starts to happen all very quickly. All that wonderful, fantastic Italian ingredients, Italian water, Italian flour, Italian yeast, Italian salt. Look, I just, I just trust them. I just think they know what they're doing. They're the experts in this realm. So who am I to question? Their products. Already that's starting to get roughly the right consistency to start kneading it by hand. I always just do a little bit of bringing it together with, um, with a spoon, metal spoon, just to start with, to avoid the messy fingers bit until as late as possible. Now I did say I'm going to include a little bit of olive oil, and it goes not a lot Still yet to be completely convinced that olive oil is a necessary ingredient in the dough recipe. But, um, but again, I'm still learning. I'll always be learning. And if I'm advised by experts to, to use olive oil in my recipe, I'll do it until I'm absolutely convinced it's not necessary. So it's starting to come together. At this point, it comes out onto this perfect pastry sulpat mat, which basically saves a lot of effort in terms of cleaning after you've done a, a dough making escapade, because it really helps by just being a very unsticky surface. It's very smooth. If things do stick to it, it's very easy to clean and basically makes life a bit easier, which is what I'm all about in the kitchen, to quote Nigel Lawson, I'm sure. It's starting to come together in a stringy fashion here. This is when a lot of people panic, I think, when they haven't made pizza dough before or aren't that used to it. They start to look at this kind of consistency and say, oh my word, this is going to be a disaster to work with. How on earth am I going to get this into a beautiful pizza dough ball? It's going to be too messy, too sticky. No, it's not the case. It just needs experience doing this a few times to understand that that's absolutely part of the process. Yes, you can use the kitchen machine. I've got the Kenwood um, kitchen machine and it makes wonderful dough. But I'm a bit of a purist, a bit of a traditionalist, and, and I like to know that I've made it by hand from scratch. There's absolutely nothing wrong with using the kitchen machines, and some, I'll still do it sometimes, but you know, I've got the time, I've certainly got the patience to do these things as manual as possible. But for sure, if I ever need to start making 
industrial amounts of pizza, we all know that that soon becomes impossible to, to do manually, so you will get machines involved. You can see this is starting to become a fairly consistent texture of pizza dough. I'm no longer seeing pockets of dried flour or pockets of extra sticky, extra moist flour. No longer seeing any pockets of oil. And it's fair to say that this is starting to get to the point very quickly. You can see now this is this has been what less than two minutes of what you might call <laughs> kneading, but it's not really kneading, it's more just working, integrating, moving, mixing the dough, giving it a bit of a slap. Very soon we'll be at the point where I just need to let this rest for 20 minutes to allow some gluten formation, which will then make this an entirely different beast to work with. It's going to go from being a bit of a challenging beast to work with to being an absolute puppy dog. We'll start being a lot more compliant in the hand, stop sticking to the hands and the mat, and your life basically becomes a lot easier instantly. Actually already start to feel it happening compared to a minute or so ago. You can probably see it's starting to look a bit different already as well. The gluten's starting to, to form at this early stage. And indeed, I feel we're at the point now where this can sit for 20 minutes. So see that did not need a lot of effort. That did not need 20 minutes worth of kneading. It needed about two minutes, three minutes. And you'll see very soon what I mean when I talk about the transformation. Now, to cover this up for 20 minutes, some people I used to go to the effort of putting this in a bowl, cling film on the bowl, make sure that it's all airtight. These days I just do this. I just cover it, come sir, and in 20 minutes we're going to see something a bit different. Mark my words. And just for reference, prior to that 20 minutes starting, well it has actually started, but just so you can see the comparison of how it's going to look, that is it prior to resting, and I'll show you exactly the same how it looks and feels in about 20 minutes, which is when we start to really get that dough prepped. Okay, it has been 22 minutes since I last showed you this. There we go. That's how the dough looks now. Let me show you how it's going to move or how it moves compared to how it did before. Apron on. This is where you want some good spatula action. I have three spatulas, my go-to spatulas. One is this kind of rubber-based, softer, more pliable, get into corners, get round there, um, kind of rounded edges. The uni, pizza dough cutter, heavier, sharper, great bit of kit, love it. And then this is your more classic kind of get under, lift up a dough ball, that kind of thing. For this situation, what I'm gonna do is just get the blue spatula to get any of those leftover bits from the edge. On there. Now, you're gonna see immediately 
how the dough is acting different. You see that? It's not sticking, it's not all, it's not sticking to my hands. There's one, one trick I do, which I think I've mentioned in the past. I do put a little bit of oil on my fingers, on my hands there. Helps with the lubrication. Oil is a lubricant. After all, you know it's olive oil. And look, no longer is that dough sticking to my hands. That's all. Completely different. Nothing's changed in the dough that we were looking at 20 minutes ago, apart from the fact it was 20 minutes ago. Why is it like this? Very simple. That 20 minutes has allowed the dough to develop glutinous elements within it. So it's sticking together more. It's more bound together. It likes to stick to itself more than it likes to stick to my hands. Steve, still almost perfectly clean and unstuck. So at this point, I'll just give myself a little bit more olive oil on my hands. this point, all we're doing is just a little bit more manipulation of the dough, not a huge amount of effort, just making sure we've got a nice consistent consistency to the dough, not putting a lot of manual effort into it. It honestly doesn't need more than about two minutes worth of work. Again, you can see, it's just moving so much easier, so much nicer and freer. And you, if you move it fast and confidently, it won't stick to your hands. I'm happy with that. That's it, done. Done for this stage. So what happens now? It goes in the bowl for about two hours. At which point it comes out of the bowl, gets separated into its six dough balls. And that rests for about another hour or so. And then can go in the fridge and the next day that evening I can make pizza with it. You can probably tell I'm a little low on olive oil. I haven't realized that, that was the case. Which is ironic because I now have my cruette here which uh, <laughs> I need to fill in with olive oil. The irony. So got a nice bit of stickiness and plate to it, which is an indication that although it's started to get glutinous, it's still got, you know, demonstrating that it's a higher hydration dough. So it's never going to be completely dry at this point. And it goes. Again, hands are pretty clean. Scraper. Dough cutter is pretty clean. Try not to waste anything if at all possible, so any extra dough I can can go on there. And 
here we go, let's have a look. That is going to proof for an hour and a half to two hours, I'd say. It's at this point that I get the cling film out to stop the air getting to it. I like it to be airtight at this point so it doesn't dry out the, the top layer of the dough. It goes on like this. Cover it up also with the tea towel. And that will sit 1.5 to 2 hours, then we can make the dough balls. Okay, here we are, 1.5 hours later. Off comes the cling film. Let me turn this light on for a bit more clarity. Now, you'll see the dough has got a bit larger. Not hugely, because there's not a huge amount of yeast in there. If there was more yeast, and especially if there was honey in there, it would have blown right up. It hasn't blown up too much, that's what I'm after. And it's looking a lot more easier to work with. So make sure this surface is clean. Put any of those small specks of dried flour. This is where we're going to start making doubles. You recall we have six doubles at 280 grams each. Six doubles, 280 grams. So let's make them. So, what I need for this part of the process is obviously the dough, the scale. Zero, the dough cutter, then a little bit of olive oil. I've got some uh, more just to keep my hands a little bit cleaned up, lubricated. And let's get this dough onto the Let's get this dough onto the mat. Try to keep the top side at the top as much as possible. You can see how this dough scraper is incredibly good for this specific job. If I was trying to do it with this, it wouldn't get into the corners so well. Same with this. The fact that's rounded and soft makes it very, very nice to, to play with. goes. Now remember, six doubles, 280 grams. I start by getting roughly the right measure. Look how beautifully this stone cutter cuts. See that straight through? Separates it because it's sharp. This uni, don't guess it. It's it's really the business when it comes to separating. So that's going to be a fifty-fifty split. Now we want to do three of each of these. I'm going to put a little bit of olive oil on my hands just to help with the
lubrication of the dough as I start to move it around a bit more. It's fine if it's getting it, it looks almost a bit greasy there. It's fine, it's, it's, um, if anything it protects it from getting dried out. Just getting the oil all around, getting it into a shape that I can cut it more easily and maybe more evenly. See if I can get those 280 grams each the first time. I probably won't, but let's see. I think that's one. And I think that's two and three. So there's three balls there. One, two, three, not three balls, three clumps of dough that will be made into balls. Then this one divided into three. I think that's one there. Four, five, and six. So let's measure these and see how they do against the expectation of 280 grams. If they're close or bang on, great, we make the balls and they're done. If they're not on 280 or nearby, then we simply just do a little bit of adjusting, which is very easy. So, here's the first one, two, seven, eight, happy. Two, six, six, let me bring that across there, happy. Maybe I'm getting better at this estimation. Two six two, happy-ish. Getting a bit on the low side, but only eighteen grams off. Two seven nine. That is the perfect size. Two eighty two seven nine. Two seven five. This is for sure the best I've ever done with my first two seven one. So here we go. First time, no manipulation needed. All those dough balls come in around 270, 280 grams. Excellent. The next step is to get the faithful uni stack ready, which is where I proof my dough balls. Obviously I can only proof three because I only have one uni stack, but I have a, some trays for the uh, for the rest, which I can use. I will top up this olive oil bottle here, kitchen grade just to help. a more controlled amount. Kitchen grade, and this just helps get a bit more of a controlled amount of oil into the location you want it. For example, a little bit here in the bottom of the uni stack, which means that it will come out easily when it comes time for dough ball extraction tomorrow. Let's make the dough ball. So, here we have it, not very shapely yet. Very quickly, we simply put our fingers in, let gravity pull the dough down slightly. It starts to take shape very quickly. And you just tuck it in on itself like this. Keep going round. Here you can see some nice bubbles forming already, proving that that um, yeast is absolutely working, active and in good shape. Always a reassuring sign. More coming through here. That's what we are after. And here you have 
a nice dough wall. Now at the bottom there, you will see it's not quite as smooth as you might want it. So a little bit more manipulation, just gentle on the bottom. There's no rush. And then you can just basically do a little bit of a pinch off. Obviously this is going to grow more both before I put it in the fridge, in the fridge and after. On the underside now you see it's coming nice and all together looking a bit more like a dog wall. That is ready to go in when you stack number one. Done. It's in. And it's sliding about a bit there because I've got that oil on the bottom. That's good, it shows it's nicely lubricated and will be easy to take out. Number two, again, a little bit of olive oil, I'd say significantly less than a teaspoon even, maybe a quarter of a teaspoon, but make sure it goes all the way around. Double number two, same, obviously, technique. The fact my hands have got quite a lot of oil in them is definitely helping this. Again, just feeding it underneath, letting the gravity pull it down. It's getting that nice, glossy feel to the top. Small movements, gentle movements, but confident movements. At the bottom, it's starting to, to look pretty decent, but I bring it together, give it a pinch. And again, Underside, top, double number two, in the stack. And it's called a stack, because it stacks. And it's the fact that it stacks is good, because it means when you put it in the fridge like this, it takes up that much space, real estate in the fridge vertically, um, i.e. the bird's eye view. And it doesn't take up a huge amount of actual ground space, which is often at a premium in fridges for people like me who aren't professional cooks and have family food in there and things like that. Here comes double number three. Just keeping it consistent, gentle, not rushing. On the side. Starting to get decent shape, pinch it a bit. Again, double number three into the stack. Sliding around again. So that's the stack four. As I said, there's three levels to the stack, three doubles. On goes the, the lid. That's good. These will basically sit for, I mean, they can sit anything up to an hour before they go in the fridge. It doesn't have to be an hour, it can be a bit less. Next, because I don't have any more, only, another only stack, I'm just using a relatively small baking tray. Same process, light brushing, finger brushing of olive oil for lubrication. Slow, confident. Again, more bubbles coming through. You can see it's quite warm tonight where I am, and you can see the bubbles forming quite quickly despite that very small amount of that great Caputo uh, yeast. I think it's fair to say the yeast is uh, the yeast is a beast. The yeast, the yeast is strong. Just pinch it up a bit. Make sure it's smooth on the bottom. Avoid, helps avoid getting any holes in your pizza. If there's, if there's gaps in there, it can develop unevenly inside. Another lovely dough ball. I will cover that with the same bit of cling film that we had used before. Make sure it doesn't get dry. Here you can see it's 
the, the cling film there is touching, therefore a tiny amount of olive oil here on top, which will just stop, stop the um, cling film from sticking to it. I like to press down gently just to get that convection. Sorry, that, just to get that concave flow of the of the cling film there, which proves that there's not excess air in there. And number four is ready to go. And last but not least, a slightly bigger tray. And yes, guys, I will be getting a second mini stack, as you can tell. Um, when you get above three dough balls, fridge space does start to become a challenge. So if I have two stacks, that'll be perfect for this situation. I believe this was the smallest of the six dough balls. This is, I think, 262 grams. Look more, more bubbling, appearing, the active yeast making, doing its thing in this dough. It's feeling beautiful, this dough, actually. I can tell it's a relatively high hydration, at least for me. Um, but still very easy to play with. Beautiful texture, nice bouncing back. Love it. Check the underside. Doesn't really need any um, assistance, that one. It's going in. Try and keep it away from the edges of the uh, of the tray if at all possible, simply because they will expand inevitably, and you don't want them to expand into the edges if at all possible, because that means you get a misshaped dough ball. Now, if you get a misshaped dough ball, it's not the end of the world, but ideally these things remain as round as possible. That means it makes it as even easier to get a round pizza when you extract them, put them on the some alina flour and start to shape them up. If they come out kind of oblong or square, it just means there's more work for you to do to get them back to being round as you go to the kind of uh, preparation phase. Again, not much um, pinching needed there. Needed, needed there. Looking good. There it goes. As much space as possible between the two. Let's have a quick look at this. Up close. Beautiful. Let's get the light in here a little bit more. See? So this dough is basically under two hours old. You're starting to see a nice amount of resistance to being pressed. Good gluten forming. Good bubbling. I'm happy with that. So the three in the stack, plus the one here, plus these two, I'll let them basically sit for another maybe 20 minutes, covered airtight, then they'll go in the fridge, and about 20 hours later, I'll make some pizza and I'll film that as well. So here I'm making the sauce. I use these Siligini Muti tomatoes straight out the tin. Add about a teaspoon, a teaspoon and a half of the same sea salt from Campisi. And I just blast it with the food processor for about 10 seconds maximum. Don't do it too long, otherwise it gets watery. It will make your pizza base get watery. So uh, you'll see here, I just give it a quick blast. Campisi salt. Grind down the fibers and it's ready to use. No other ingredients, no herbs, no olive oil, no garlic, no basil, just tin tomatoes and sea salt. That is it. Quick whisk.
go. Here I'm just putting some more cheapo 00 flour down on the mat to land the dough balls in when they come out of the only stack. That's how you just make sure that you get rid of any extra, um, I guess, dampness of the pizza dough to make sure it doesn't stick. You land it in that flour, turn it over once or twice. Then I have a little bit of uh, that semolina flour on the right just to put on the pizza peel to help it be sticking there. I don't use too much. It can clump up and get burnt in the oven if you use too much. Just a tiny, tiny amount, just to add a little bit That's of, uh, let's say, lubrication. Make sure, um, yeah, the, the pizza flies off that peel smoothly. It sounds silly, but also just remember, get your other paraphernalia out, you know, your pizza board, the pizza cutter, because when you start getting into the process of landing these pizzas out the oven, you, um, you kick yourself if you rise, you've got something still tucked away somewhere, and you're scrabbling around. So I always go through a bit of a checklist, I've got them written down actually, and that just uh, makes sure I know exactly what I need to prepare prior to making the first pizza. You can see me there applying the semolina flour on the peel. And I'm starting to get out my first dough ball from the oven stack to make the first pizza. So I always, if possible, used dry mozzarella that comes in a block. Here I've already cut this up uh, probably about an hour ago and now I'm just cutting it down to a more kind of uh, deployable size. So it's not going to be too liquid now. It's not going to create um, puddles on the pizza. But yeah, I just like to make little cubes that I can throw on the pizza. And they melt in an even manner. Of course, also, it's important to make enough of all this stuff. If you don't grate enough parmesan, if you don't cut enough dry mozzarella, if you don't have enough basil ready to go and washed, you know, you, you end up delaying your pizza making process, which means that sometimes dough balls can be lying around on the peel a bit longer than they should be. And yeah, so just, I always find solid preparation, give yourself an extra 10, 15 minutes, don't rush, make sure you've gone through everything you need before you start getting that dough out and uh, you'll thank yourself. So now, the moment of truth, let's get this dough ball out of the stack. That round. Beautiful. Yep, you can see I'm just gradually putting that round spatula into the corner of the stack so between the glass and the dough ball. Very easily. Not rushing it, but it's not a fiddly no, job. It's actually very easy. It just releases thing. it a bit at the side, obviously the Olive oil that's already been put in there the day before helps, and you'll see how quickly the dough ball just slides out onto that Slowly reducing itself. The flour that I'd already put down. It usually comes from one side. That's a nice profile shot. It's good that the stack is uh, transparent, so you can really see how that glutinous strands are holding it to the the stack but just coming off bit by bit it's a very cathartic satisfying process actually they're the last little strands coming off the bottom of the stack there and there we go 
quick close up on that. Lovely and round. It's been like great dough. A couple of times just turn it in that flour. Over to here. And you obviously you dump bits, get the flour at the top. Get a few air in it already. Very nice. Actually pushing that air that's pocketed within the dough to the outsides. Very gradual, keeping a nice lip all the way around 360 degrees. You can see some bubbles starting to form on the edges there. I'm not rushing this, I'm making sure I'm maintaining a good round pizza. In the past I was struggling with the roundness of my pizzas and I think in hindsight the reason for that was I was simply going a bit too fast in this in this part of the process. I'd watched so many professionals, pizzolos, doing this in about 10 seconds, but I'm not one of those guys, you know? I've made 0.01% of the amount of pizzas they have, so I have to take a little bit more time to develop this, keep it in the right shape, do a tiny bit of a stretch there, just hang it off my knuckles, and what that does is give it some stretch under gravity but maintain the shape. You can see I uh, pinched out a developing air pocket there because those air pockets are the bits that tend to, to uh, blow up a little bit more when they get in the oven and then get burned. So yeah, it's best to really get rid of those. You just give them a quick squeeze and the air dissipates. On goes that sauce, not too much. On goes the palm, fresh parmesan. Now you saw me grate this, uh, well cut up this dried mozzarella as well. It's always the inclination to put on too much. Try not to. It's better if it's a little bit more sparse, but relatively evenly applied. One goes a bit of so now some beautiful fresh basil. basil. This is always one of the most satisfying parts of the pizza making process for me, seeing that basil go on, knowing it's going to be cooked at high heat for a very short amount of time to release those marvelous flavors. And then a quick squirt of olive oil. Put over to the peel, you see didn't stretch too much, it didn't disfigure too much. But of course, always you have to just make sure make on sure the peel the shape's good. that you've got it round. And make sure it's moving on the peel nicely, which it is. Then it's moving nicely on the peel, ready for launch. This is good to go. So the moment of joy, here it comes. Moving nicely on the peel again. When I shook it, it wasn't catching in any part. I've made sure the Unicoda 16 here is about 430 degrees in the center. Look, it's never gonna be exactly that perfect temperature, but there or thereabouts. 500 is too much, and it will burn the underside, but about 430 or so is a good heat to make sure you get a fast rise that you can see happening already in this. About 20 seconds in, those air pockets are starting to to fill and grow rapidly, that is what you're looking for. If it was, if the oven wasn't hot enough, you wouldn't see that happen so fast. So it's a fine balance between getting it hot enough to grow that that dough quickly in the oven, whilst not being too hot to burn the underside. It's generally, I'd say generally, I've found about two minutes maximum to cook these pizzas when I've uh, got it at the optimal temperature. I have to balance and keep it not too far back to the left, as you can see the flames at the back and on the left hand side in the Unicoda 16. You can see that's wonderful, the cheese is, is really, really uh, getting that little brown tinge on it, which means that the top is cooked as well as the bottom. and. 
we are in business. Let's take a look at that pizza inside. I gave it a little bit of a, it's not exactly a doming. A doming is when you lift it up to the top of the pizza oven just to give it a little bit extra. That was just a tiny couple more seconds in the heat to make sure it's cooked thoroughly. So here it is. That is a pretty wonderful looking pizza, in my humble opinion. Let's have a look on the underside. Good. It's a good colour. Some might say a little bit too much charring, but I'm happy. little bit of truffle oil, very small oil. Should be rather good.
moving nicely. It's moving nicely. Tomato fungi. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you found that useful. It truly has been an end-to-end -end cycle of how to make the dough, how to prep the dough, how to proof the dough, how to make the pizza, how to cook the pizza. So if you found this useful, please consider subscribing and liking the video. That's much appreciated. Take care.